Julie of the Wolves, page 178. One night, when Mayak sewed a new boot, Capu licked her ear and trotted off. When he did not come back by the time the moon had swung all the way around the tent and was back again, a whole day, she went out to look for him. The snow glowed blue and green and the constellations glittered, not only in the sky, but on the ice and the river and on the snow and the, uh, and the bushes and trees. There was, however, no sign of Capu. She was about to go to bed when the horizon quivered and she saw her pack running the bank. Capu was in the lead. She crawled back in her tent and awakened turn it. Capu is leading the hunt. All's well, she said, and now we must leave them. At dawn, she hastily took down her tent, hoisted her pack into her back, and stepped in onto the frozen river where walking was easier. Many miles along her way, she came upon wolverine tracks and followed them up to a den. There, as she suspected, lay several rabbits and ptarmigan. She loaded them on her sled and returned to the river, listening to turn it peep soft clover songs into the warmth of her parka hood. She kissed his beak gently. They were helping each other. She kept him warm and fed him, and he radiated heat in her hood. But more important, his whisperings kept her from being totally and hopelessly lonely without Capu and her wolf pack. With every mile she traveled now, the oil drums became more and more numerous, and the tracks of the wolverine more and more scarce. Like the wolf, the wolverine is an animal of the wilderness. And when Mayak saw no more tracks, she knew she was approaching man. One night, she counted 50 drums on a spit in the river, and there she made camp. She must stop and think about what she wanted to do. When she thought of San Francisco, she thought about the airplane and the fire and the blood and the flashes and death. When she took out her needle and sewed, she thought about peace and armor rock. She knew what she had to do, live like an Eskimo, hunt and carve and be with Turnit. The next day, she took out her man's knife and cut blocks of snow. These she stacked and shaped into a house that was gener generously large. If she was going to live as an Eskimo once lived, she needed a home, not just a camp. When her ice house was completed and her skins were spread across the floor, she sat down and took out the totem of Armorak. Her fingers had rubbed him into a soft glow in her pocket, and he looked rich and regal. Placing him over the door, she blew him a kiss and as she did so, happiness welled up in her. She knew he was taking care of her spirit. Time passed, fountains of the magnetic northern lights came and went, and the moon waxed and waned many times. Mayax found her life very satisfying. She became an expert at catching small game, and she took great pleasure in carving. When she had finished the carving of the puppies, she found a stone by the river and began chipping it into an owl. Always she listened for her pack but they did not call. She was both glad and miserable. Max was not without things to do. When she was not hunting or carving, she danced, sewed, chopped wood, or made candles. Sometimes she tried to spell Eskimo words with the English alphabet. Such beautiful words must be preserved forever. One night, she began a tiny coat of Tarmington feathers for Turnit. He had been shivering lately, even in her parka hood, and she was concerned about him. She stitched the plumes to the paper-thin rabbit hide and fashioned a bird-like coat. On the moonrise, when the coat was finished and she was trying to slip it on turn it, she heard in the distance the crackle of feet on the ice. The sound grew louder and she poked her head into the night to see a man on the river running beside his sled and team of dogs. Her heart leaped, an Eskimo hunter, one of her own pack, truly. Rushing onto the river ice, she waited until the sled drew close. Aya, she called. Aya, the voice answered, and within minutes, the hunter pulled the sled up beside her and greeted her warmly. Nestled in the furs was, a, was the man's woman and child. Their eyes glistened softly in the moonlight. My ex voice was hoarse from disuse, but she managed to greet them happily in Eskimo and invite them into her house for a sleep. The woman was glad to stop. She told My ex an epic dialect as she climbed from the sled. They had not rested since they had left Kingik, a town on Cuck Bay by the, mouse, by the mouth of the Avalik River, the river they were on. At last, my ex knew where she was. Kangik was inland from Wainwright and still many sleeps from Point Barrow, but she no longer cared. I'm rolling, the man said in English as he unloaded his sleeping skins on the floor of the igloo and spread them out. Are you alone? My ex smiled at him as if 
she did not understand and put a twisted spruce log on the fire. When it blazed, the man and woman were warming their backs. Roland asked her again, but this time in Yupik, her own beautiful tongue. She answered that she was. I'm Alice, the pretty mother said. Mayax gestured hopelessly. Uma, the woman said, pointing to herself. Attic, she said, pointing to the man, and lifting the baby above her head, called him Sorkak. Mayax found the name so nice that she took her cooking pot from the fire to offer her guests hot termingen. She hummed and sang. Then she went to her sleeping skin, picked up Turnit, and held him before Sorkak, who was now on his mother's back in her knapsack. She, he peeked over her shoulder, laughed at the bird, kicked, and disappeared. In his excitement, he had lost his knee grip that had dropped to his mother's belt. Mayax laughed aloud. Uma giggled and gave him a boost. His round face reappeared, and he reached for the bird. Mayax suddenly wanted to talk. Speaking rapidly in Upik, she told her guests about the river, the game, the fuel, and the stars, but not about the wolves or her past. They listened and smiled. When dinner was over, Attic talked slowly and softly, and Mayax learned that Kangik was an Eskimo village with an airport and a mission school. A generator had been built, and electricity lighted the houses in winter. A few men even owned snowmobiles there. Attic was proud of his town. Before going to bed, he went out to feed the dogs. Then Uma talked. She said they were headed for the mountains to hunt caribou. When Attic returned, Mayax told him, he did not need to go to the mountains, that a large herd was yarded not far up the river. She drew a map on the floor and showed him where the wintering grounds of the caribou lay. He was happy to learn this, he said, for the brook's range was, te- was treacherous in winter. Whole mountainsides avalanched and storms brewed up in mere minutes. Uma nursed the baby, tucked him into furs, and, sang- and softly sang him to sleep as the fire began to die down. Presently, her head nodded, and she slipped into bed, where Attic joined her. My ex alone was awake, visions of Kangik filling her head. She would go there and be useful. Perhaps she would teach children how to snare rabbits, make parkas, and carve. Or she might live with a family that needed her help. She might even work in the store. In Kangik, she would live as her ancestors had, in rhythm with the animals and the climate. She would stay far away from San Francisco, where men were taught to kill without reason. She did not fall asleep for hours. Turnit awoke first and called softly. Mayak stressed, cut off a piece of meat, and held it out to him. He snatched the food and swallowed it noisily. That awoke the baby, and the baby awoke Uma, who reached out, took him to her breast, and rocked him as she lay in the furry warmth of her skins. It was almost zero in the house, and she did not hurry to get up. Attic awoke, yawned, and roared. I'm hungry. Uma laughed, and Mayak put the pot on the fire. Attic dressed, went out to a sled, and brought back bacon, bread, beans, and butter. Mayak had forgotten there were such good things in her mouth, in her mouth, fairly watered as she smelled them cooking. At first, she refused the food when Uma offered it, but seeing how disappointed she was, she accepted the bacon and sucked on it quietly, remembering with pain the tastes of Baro. After breakfast, Attic went out to harness the dogs. Mayak cleaned up, and Uma played with the baby. As she tossed him, she chatted happily about her love for Attic and how excited she had been when he decided to take her on the hunt. Most Eskimo wives were left home these days. With the advent of gussic frozen foods, cooks were no longer needed for the hunt. And the women never tanned hides anymore. All skins for the tourist trade must go to Seattle to be tanned correctly for the temperature climates where most were shipped. Uma rambled on. Attic had been raised in Anchorage and knew very little about hunting, for his father had been a mechanic. But he had died, and Attic was sent to live with his grandfather in Kangik. He had become enamored of, hun- of hunting and fishing and became so skilled that when his grandfather died, he was adopted by the greatest of all Eskimo hunters. Kafagoon taught Attic where the seals live and how to smell a caribou trail. Mike stopped cleaning her pot. Her blood raced hot, then cold. Turning slowly around, she stared at Uma. Where was this Kapugun born? She asked Neskimo. He had never said. He paddled up the river one day, beached his kayak, and built a house where he landed. All I know is that he came out of the Bering Sea. But he was wealthy in the Eskimo sense, intelligent, fearless, full of love, and he soon became the leader of Kangik. 
Mayax did not take her eyes off Uma's lips as they formed soft words of Kapagoon. Uya Kangik? she asked. Yes, but not in the center of town where the rich men live. Although Kapagoon is also rich, he lives in the simple green house on the riverbank. It is upstream beside the wilderness where the people he loves feel free to visit. Trembling with eagerness, Mayax asked Uma to tell her more about Kapagoon, and Uma, spilling over with enthusiasm, told how the town and its people had grown poor and hungry several years ago. The walrus had all but vanished from the coast, the gray whales were rare, and the seals were few and far between. The Bureau of Indian Affairs put almost everyone on pensions, so they drank and forgot all they knew. Then Kapagoon arrived. He was full of pride and held his head high. He went out into the wilderness and came back with the musk oxen, those he bred and raised. The men helped him. The women made the fur into thread and then into mittens and beautiful sweaters and scarves. These were sold to gussics who paid high prices for them, and within a few years the people of Kangik became independent and prosperous. But there is still need for caribou and wolverine furs for clothing and trim, she said. So Capagoon and Attic go hunting every winter to supply the town. Capagoon did not come this year, she went on. He let me come instead. She smiled, slipped her baby into her gussic, tightened her belt, and stood up. Capagoon is wise and strong. Mayax turned her back to Uma. She must not see the quivering of her body at every mention of her father's name. He had been dead to her. For so long, she was almost frightened by the knowledge that he lived. Yet he loved each cold chill that told her it was true. Outside, the dogs began fighting over their rations, and Attic's whip cracked like a gunshot. Mayak shivered at the sound. She thought of Armorak, and tears welled in her eyes, but she did not fall, for she was also thinking about Capigan. She must find him. He would save the wolves just as he had saved the people of Kangik. Armorak! Armorak! she sang as she fluffed up her furs. Uma turned to her in surprise. You are happy after all, she said in Eskimo. I thought perhaps this was the beginning of your periods that you and your family had sent you to, to a hut and be alone. The old grandmother who raised me did that, and I was miserable and so unhappy because no one does that anymore. Maya shook her head. I am not yet a woman. Uma did not inquire further, but hugged her. Then she put her baby in her cuspuck and crept out of the door to join Attic in the starlit darkness. It was day, and the constellations of the southern hemisphere were shining overhead. The dogs were biting their harnesses and fighting each other, and Attic was trying to make them hold still. Suddenly, they lunged in all directions, and the sled was moving. Attic picked up Uma and the baby, put them on the sled, and calling his grateful thanks to Mayax, took off. She waved until they were lost in the darkness, then rushed into her house, rolled up her sleeping skins, and loaded her sled. She hoistened her pack, to her back and picked up Turnit. Carefully, she slipped the feather coat around his breast and leaving his wings free, tied the little coat on his back. He looked silly. She laughed, rubbed her nose against his beak and tucked him into the hood of her parka. Emma Aya, Aya Emma. She sung as she slid into the river, put on her snowshoes and strode down the snapping ice bed. She had gone about a mile when she heard Kapu bark. She knew it was he. His voice was unmistakable. Terrified, she turned around. Stay, stay, she screamed. The wind picked up her words and blew them down the river. Kapu ran up to follow her, followed by nails in the puffs. All were yipping authoritatively as they told her to join them. I cannot, she cried. My own armorock lives. I must go find him. She walked forward a few steps and turned and glared as the wolf leader had done. For a moment, they hesitated, as if not believing her message. Then they dashed away and ran up to the river. They called Beck from the bank and they were gone. Myax had spoken her last words to her wolves.